Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're glad that you're here at the uh, Transgender Day of Remembrance Memorial Service and Discussion. Uh, it's being hosted by the, Na the Green Party National Women's Caucus, Lavender Caucus, and the Diversity Committee. Again, welcome. My name is Deanna Taylor, or most of you know me as D, D Taylor, and I'm a co-chair of the Green Party of the United States National Women's Caucus. And we also have with us Starlene Rankin, who is our other co-chair. Um, we're going to get right into this today, and I'm going to turn the time over to um, Green Party of the United States co-chair, uh, Margaret Elizabeth, who is also co-chair of the Lavender Caucus. So I'm going to turn it over to Margaret. Thank you, Dee. Uh, thank you, uh, National Women's Caucus and Lavenders and Diversity Committee for hosting this event and coordinating with all of our colleagues and comrades, both in the party and without, to come and talk to us today and listen to our perspectives about what's going on. And though we had an agenda that already was set, um, I'm going to kind of interrupt that right now, and we're going to talk about what happened last night. If you're unaware, um, last night um, in Colorado Springs, around 11.57 p.m., the call went out uh, to 911 from a club called the uh, Club Q. Uh, police arrived on the scene, and they had found that there had been a multiple shooting committed by a person later identified as Anderson Lee Aldrich, who had been subdued by several patrons on the scene. At the moment, we know that there are uh, five people killed and 18 people injured. The uh, club itself is hosting a regular Saturday event where they host drag shows. And this was a particular one to commemorate, in fact, TDOR. So this was a very targeted event. Um, Anderson Aldrich previously has um, been arrested for bomb threats and possession of weapons. So he was on the radar of the police as somebody who could be responsible or commit these sorts of crimes. And despite having been arrested, was released and was able to get access to the same weapons, the same kinds of things that every mass shooter in this country has ever used. I'm extraordinarily angry and frustrated. I don't have the words to express to you the, the level of absolute outrage that I feel right now. But more than that, my broken heart from my community and the people who are at that club, the victims, their families, and everyone who is involved. This is a terrible tragedy. It's not the first, and it will not be the last. We're seeing it in real time. Right now, 150 laws this year have been proposed targeting the queer community specifically, targeting trans youth, targeting trans people in general to keep us out of public life in every sphere. This is not an accident. This is absolutely on purpose. Uh, colleagues, I don't know what to tell you, except that we can't win this fight without your help. Our allies are our only hope here in this, and our backs are against the wall. I know it seems sometimes like we are speaking hyperbole when we speak about the feeling of threat that we feel, the, the nature of the pervasiveness of it, but we're talking about just these sorts of things. Going to a random nightclub on a Saturday night just because you are queer and you are targeted and murdered for it. This is the life that we face, and it is awful. It is awful. And I have to stop before I break my heart even more. And I, ooh, I want to get through it without doing that. <laughs> so I'm going to stop now and I'm going to turn over the mic. But my friends, uh, thank you for being here and participating in this conversation with us. It's not going to be an easy one. Thank you uh, so much. And so I'll give the mic. I think we're going to back to you, Dee. Is that correct? Or... We're actually going to go now to, thank you, Margaret Elizabeth. We're going to go now to uh, Dawn Marie, who's going to uh, run things from here. Hi there. I am uh, staying off video because I've had, been running my own errands this morning and working without an electrical system. Um, we have got a ten, five to 10 minute um, conversation from each of the three panelists and the people that are on the discussion, Margaret Elizabeth, Blazon Bloom, and Cynthia Bryan-Kate. And um, we are going to start that with Blazon Bloom right now. And then Margaret, are you okay with going second? 
and then Cynthia will be third, then we will open it up for um, conversation and discussions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So for those of you who may not know me, I'm Blazin Buckshot Bloom. If you didn't see him on the Matt Ho rallies, I actually recently just got done running for a school board of all offices here in Chesapeake, Virginia, the second largest city in the state, 90th largest city in the country, and a fairly conservative city. My decision to run actually dates back to August of last year. We had this phenomenal um, transmodal policy here in the state of Virginia that was was revolutionary and was a was a culture shock. The refusal of of individuals in our city, the the resistance it faced was was disgusting. It was ridiculous. It was something that was sorely sorely needed. Having just graduated from high school last August, it was it was nice to see something that would have been of great benefit to myself. To, to classmates. In my own in my own time, we in Chesapeake, there wasn't a single openly trans individual until my senior year of high school, in which case there was me and one other person. To see such hate being spewed by individuals who by and large are uninformed, who are made fearful by many individuals on the far right who seek to weaponize that fear to their own advantage. Is, is something that continues to, to damage our country, to, continues to prevent progress from occurring. That month of fighting for a policy that was so desperately needed, but that continued to get cut and cut and cut and cut down until it was barely anything, is the reason why, in part, the reason why I decided to run. Because our students, our trans students, our city needed to see that there, it wasn't just hate, it wasn't just bigotry, but that for every person who speaks ill, that there is so, so many more of us, people who are willing to stand up and fight for what's right, to fight for the rights of others, because hate can be something that can mobilize people to act, that can create such un, an understandable feelings and emotions that while we may not understand it can be frightening can drive people to do to do crazy actions and as as we sit here today thinking of where we are today as a society both within our country and across the globe and where we can move forward how we can continue to develop the world we live in for a way that is sustainable that is inclusive of all voices no matter how we may experience life, no matter what we may feel, no matter how old, how young, in what stage of life we are, it's important to look back at why people act the way they do and to see how can we deprogram this hate? How can we show them that what they see, what they hear is not the truth, that it's simply fear mongering that has no, no basis in reality, that goes against everything that seemingly should be believed upon when it comes to rights. And to see that these, these attacks, these backlashes, these regressions that we're seeing across the country and state legislators, even here in Virginia with the election of our new governor, that this is only temporary, that this has to be temporary. Because if it isn't, there's, it doesn't spell good things. But if we, if we stand up, if we fight back, if we rally, if we build community, we can show our communities, our country, the importance of, of inclusivity, the importance of understanding, the importance of pushing forward, not regressing backwards. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Blazon. Now we're going to turn it over to uh, Margaret Elizabeth. It's not letting her unmute. Just one minute.
Okay, let's try it again now. Perfect. Um, them, please. Um, so. Them, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's okay. Um, so thank you, Blazon. I really, of course, the NLGC endorsed your campaign. We were really happy to. I thought you ran a great one. I really, really liked your energy, energy there. What I really appreciated too, and I know that this is kind of a tricky thing, but it's important for young people to stand up in front of their, their city councils, in front of the people who are making the rules so they can be heard directly. It's one thing to hear from parents and it's one thing to hear from concerned adults like me about like the issues that are facing young people, but it's better for young people to have agency and be able to speak for themselves and talk about what's going on. So I really have appreciated that from you. My, of course, this past year, like since the last time we all got together, um, I did what, you know, my, my speech today was going to be quite a bit different than how it started. And I, and I know that in light of what's going on, this might kind of seem odd, but it was a, uh, I don't even know how to phrase this properly, but it was a good year. It was a down year. I don't, again, the words are not right here, but it was a less year in terms of trans people being killed than the previous year. So that's good um, by quite a bit, to be fair. And that's a good thing. But again, you know, we are then faced with these mass events where we're not going to know the totals of these things at the end. So, but any person being, of course, killed for who they are is one person too many. So it's strange to say, well, it's a good year because there was only 30 of us killed. I mean, it's a very morbid place to be. It's it's a macabre perspective to have where like literally my community is very small. This is, my, is one of those things that perhaps isn't quite as apparent on the outside, but generally speaking in the United States, trans people make up hmm, roughly 2% of our population all told. And in my own particular you know, peer group and stuff, it's even much smaller than that. It's less than 1%. So my community is really, really small. And so these events that happen in what seem like, oh, kind of out of the way, the places aren't out of the way in terms of my friend networks, where it's literally that one or two degrees of separation in most of our community. And it so these losses hurt, right, in ways that are hard to really articulate. Every, uh, and then what do you and what do you do? There's no words to be said here. There's no palliative words at all. There's nothing I can say to parents in Texas who know if they get help for their trans kids, they're likely facing their kids getting taken from them and put into foster care. They themselves could be in jail, and the doctor who provides that care could lose their license and also be in jail. There is an absolute effort to take trans people out of the public sphere. These things are not accidental, as I was alluding to before. If you may uh, recall attending the a and in 2020, I spoke very specifically about LGBTQI rights being a canary in the coal mine for human rights. What happens to us first happens to everybody else they want to do it to. And it's really easy to see these things. The reason they want to control trans women's bodies, and they talk about it really specifically as trans women's bodies, right? It's to, to control women's bodies. We see exactly what they did so they can control abortion, so they can outlaw them. That was the whole plan. And you have to come at it obliquely because if they came straight up and we're like, we're just going to roll back row, everyone would have been up in arms. But if they come at it, you know, like, well, what about women's sports? We never really cared about volleyball before, but I sure am interested now. It makes a different argument and people will buy it and regular people will swallow these um, <clears throat> dog whistles, these baits to get them walking right down this path into fascism. Um, there's a real you know, common saying in my community that the surest entry into fascism is transphobia. When you see somebody who is expressing those sorts of views deliberately and openly, you know they are walking that path. It is nothing but that. And so, you know, Texas is doing this. You know, Florida, they have recently passed a, a bill. So they are going to forcibly detransition everybody who is receiving public medical assistance there. That's it. They're just going to not do it anymore. This is so beyond the pale. And it, in some way, it's like, how could this happen? How could any reasonable people think these things and do this stuff until you start seeing the experts who they bring in to talk about this stuff? It's 
the Catholic Church. It's really special interest groups who have a particular interest in A, controlling abortion, and B, controlling women's bodies. And they do it through this mechanism. Does it really, really you know, suck that my community is the political football that not just gets thrown around, but then sacrificed at the end? Yes, it really is. And yes, it really does. But that doesn't change it. The suckiness does not change this. It is what's occurring. So my efforts here in the party, you know, are to help, you know, y'all see those things to help people outside the party see the green perspectives about what's going on. Like, okay, great. Sure, that's all happening. We all see it. What's the Green Party say about that? What's your what's your thought about what we should do here? And you know, I want to say <laughs> my colleagues might differ with me on some of these things, but I'm like, you know, let's let's Marsha Johnson really set a pretty good example. We should drop bricks through windows and stuff. There, you know, we didn't get our civil rights by being passive and by being nice. And we're not going to retain them in that same way. And and friends. This is where we are. This is the fact of the civilization and society that we're living in at the moment. And we're faced with a challenge. And, you know, it's not the same for everybody. It's not even the same for everybody in the broader LGBTQIA plus community. But if you're a trans person, a gender nonconforming person or a queer person and just in some flavor, you're facing it directly. You're the, the poster kid of the culture war, if you will. And the other side is coming right for us. And so, you know, I'm, I feel pretty good that I have an opportunity to organize politically with people who, you know, even if they're not in my community, support my community. It's not just lip service stuff. It's real material support. Like y'all really do understand our issues and try to understand them and put the work in to feel like you're included in a, in a meaningful sense when we talk about these things. And I appreciate it. So many people I know will tell me, oh, yes, I'm very much an ally, and then literally have no idea what's going on in our community, why we're in so much danger, and why we feel so much under threat. So it's it's really challenging. I, you know, you see it all the time, everywhere we go in the party, where there is an opportunity for education, there's an opportunity to explain to somebody to find, you know, people who are naturally just misinformed or ignorant about situations or circumstances which change pretty fast even in our own community many of us struggle keeping up with like you know new neo pronouns and and things of this nature so it's not you know it's it's a process it's a learning effort and and therein lies a bit of the the trick right it's a bit of an effort it's a work we all learn we all learn together but you have to want to do it so i'm really glad to be able to organize with folks like y'all who who do want to do that stuff it's a lot of uh, words for me and i'm just going to blame the coffee for some of that and my agitation for the rest of it so thank you so much and that will i believe taking me back to don marie thank you don marie and now we're going to introduce cynthia um cynthia brian kate is actually a survivor of a hate crime cynthia can you talk with us yes hi everybody my name is cynthia brian kate she her pronouns and yeah, I will give the quick trigger warning that what I say will not be cuddly, but it's important. This event is not cuddly, but it's important. Okay, why are we here today? What is Transgender Day of Remembrance? Transgender Day of Remembrance is a worldwide, originally local to California, but it's a worldwide event started by Gwendolyn Ann Smith because two trans women were brutally murdered, Rita Hester and Chanel Pickett. Their murders weren't solved. The media was not respecting their gender, nor were the authorities in many cases. So people in the Bay Area said, no more. We're not going to let this happen without at least saying no, and certainly not without some kind of fight. So they organized this as a community memorial for people coming from a place of grief and rage. And I will say, I will freely admit, that is the place I have come to on this. I do come from, to this from a place of grief for the people who have needlessly been killed, the people who I have to worry about needlessly being killed. This should not, this should not be a current event. This should be a historical thing. I pray every year for half obsolescence where I can wake up, people aren't being killed for their gender anymore, and I can just talk about the bad old days, but so far we're still in the bad old days. I come to this from a place of rage because right now, 
there are even more concerted attacks. Everything Margaret said is not only true, I can say some more to that, of the attempt to pretty much exterminate and annihilate people like me and Margaret and Blaze and all the other people who in any way step outside of gender stereotypes. And I, can, I come to this because the personal is political. 22 years ago, August 2000, I did not realize I was walking into a war zone. I went to a movie with a friend at, late at night, decided, okay, midnight movie, you'll be fine. It was not fine. I had an impromptu mob come together. They did not distinguish between LGBTQI and A. To them, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, asexual, didn't matter. It was just how many anti-gay epithets could they dumb it down to while they chased us with improvised weapons. And I decided then and there, no more. I'm a comic book nerd. I swore on my aunt's floor that night. If no one else is going to play Wonder Woman, I guess I'm going to have to do my own Diana Prince for everybody I care about, starting with myself. And since then, that started me on the path to every activism I have ever done, especially on all the gender stuff. I happen to be a transgender woman and an intersex chimera, biologically in between male and female, because I'm the result of merged siblings in utero. Was raised a guy by well meaning, clueless people, found out I'm, I'm a woman anyway, and along the way have had to fight simply to not get killed by haters. And this is the thing one life uh, is too many. One person killed in this kind of violence is too many. What we have this year in particular, as every year that things go back to, TDOR has been observed since 1999. We have a much too, much too many. Margaret mentioned many of the American cases. If you take this on as the worldwide problem of worldwide violence and people trying to kill us, there's been something like 300 cases this year, if you count every country on earth that has sent in a case report, including many states in the United States where I'm currently standing with my phone in my other hand. And this is the thing. We are here... We are here to observe a a very important and urgent day that brings up that these people should not be dead. They should not have been murdered. Nobody should be murdered. If you go back for the past uh, 50 years or so, there are nearly 3,000 people or thereabouts that have been killed. None of them should have died by murder. Nobody should be killed for being who they are. And that's what this is about. The haters kill because of their perception, perceived sex, perceived gender, perceived sexuality. They lump it all together. We know that your biological sex, whether male, female, or intersex, isn't the same as your gender expression of your gender identity. Whether you feel like a guy, a girl, or someone else entirely, and however you express that would clothes, hair, makeup, jewelry, mannerisms, interests, hobbies, all that. And that's not the same as sexuality, who you're attracted to romantically or sexually. But the haters are trying to punish any of us who step outside those stereotypes, including cisgender people, people who do not identify as trans, who identify with the sex they were expected to be at birth. If you look on the list uh, at, okay, the website, tdor.translivesmatter.info, That should have all the info, all the cases. And if you look back through there, there are some cis allies and friends who were killed for supporting and defending their trans friends. This is a systemic violence that is created by haters based on their perception that we should not exist in their world when, no, it's our world, all of our world. And we will fight to be able to exist. It's just basically... People, people seem to think that, oh, we ended one political administration by one corporate party in favor of another. So everything's going to be fine. It'll be fine. No, it wasn't. Cynthia? How did we get, how did we get here? We got here by complacency and trust in the two-party system. And we cannot have that because right now 
we have all these laws that are trying to annihilate us, trying to pass laws like in Florida and Texas to detransition and force trans youth to not talk about themselves, not be themselves. That's a recipe for suicide because the haters can't march us into one oven. They're trying to outlaw our, our children, youth, and teens in hopes that they will do the job by their own hand. I worked at a trans and gender diverse suicide prevention hotline for two years. And without identifying anyone anywhere, I'll say that we had teens from such places and we need to stand up against that kind of stuff. We need to stand up against mass shootings. We need to stand up against the individual violence. And okay, I have a job for the entire Green Party. We are the party that is better than the two corporate guys. So first of all, I feel that this party needs to own and claim that we are trans and gender affirming. We have it in the platform. I want everybody that hears my voice today to think about this from now on. You know, we're Greens. We support people's right to identify with and express whatever gender they are, no matter whether it's one that you've heard of or one that you haven't. And also, our platform has some things that I would like fixed. Okay. One of the biggest demographics that's being murdered are transgender sex workers. In fact, the violence is intersectional. You have an intersection of race, class, gender, sexuality, biases against all these, along with anti-immigrant biases, anti-sex worker biases, ableism, and a whole bunch of other nasty oppressions that all somehow collide together uh, in too, too often. The biggest demographic being killed are trans women of color in economically disadvantaged areas, particularly those who are in any way involved in sex work. Sex work needs to be decriminalized and destigmatized. Our platform has some very wonky language on that that I, for one, recommend that we look at as soon as we can and fix that, because that will go a long way toward making it clear we are the party that actually cares and wants people to be safe. A sex worker should be able to go to the cops and not worry about being arrested, attacked, or even killed by the cops. Also... We have these bigoted lawmakers who are trying to pass laws to get rid of our youth. Not just the yeah, big just saying that a trans person who's under 18 can't compete in sports. That's stealing the dreams of trans athletes. We, mean, we need to oppose those kind of laws. We also need to oppose other laws because this is the thing. Margaret's right. This is a concerted attack by as many multi-prongs as the haters can. If they can't get people to kill us in the streets then they will kill us in the legislature unless we stand up to that and say, hell no. In Michigan, on National Coming Out Day, some very right-wing, cis male, cis het lawmakers tried to pass a law. So far, it seems stalled, but the fact that it's even put in there disgusts me. On National Coming Out Day, this was planned, this was orchestrated, this was definitely concerted to put in a bill in that if a young person comes out as trans, if their parents would support them, the parents would go to jail for life. If the doctor, if their doctor gave any gender affirming help, ditto on the doctor going to the big house for life. That bill is stalled. I thank the, I thank everything I believe in and everyone I believe in that that bill is stalled. It shouldn't be there. We shouldn't have that sitting over our heads like a doomsday device in the Bond film, the clock at five minutes to zero. We need to oppose these laws. We need to put in better lawmakers. And we need to say, no, we refuse to abide by don't say gay. We refuse to abide by don't say trans. And you know what? Next year is, let's see, next, okay, next year is 2023. 2024 is the year after. That's the year I have my eyes on because unfortunately, some of these haters are actually looking to get the White House. We have a presidential nominating conference uh, two years from this past summer. And I, for one, want us to actually have a better candidate because the Santos, who's trying to exterminate uh, trans people from young to old in Florida uh, by passing laws that annihilate us, he's one of the people who wants the White House. And we should not have to trust the one corporate party or another and hope that uh, whichever overlord rules over us is benevolent. We need to put somebody better there. We need to have somebody who is trans affirming at the very least. I frankly want to see some 
candidates for legislative stuff who are Greens, who are trans, gender nonconforming, intersex, non-binary, anywhere in my community. Because I see this as my tribe, all the people whose gender identities or expressions don't fit uh, traditional cisgender stereotypes, we're under attack. And I say that we stand up to that. That's why we have TDOR, to stand up against bigotry, hatred, and murder. And that's something that I think the Green Party, we already have it in our platform. It's our talk. I say we do everything we can to walk that talk as hard and good as we can. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, we are at 3.33 Eastern time, and we are gonna start the uh, question and answer session now. We're gonna be using the stock system. So if you have something that you wanna say, please say stack or raise your hand in the um, virtual side. I'll start this off with the first question. Um, what can be done to help reduce the amount of violence in regards to education? Does anyone want to take that? Margaret Blazon, I just talked for what feels like uh, who knows how long. You folks want to go first? I can give it. Uh, I can give a go at that. So. So uh, what can we do to lessen violence in terms of education? Um, you know, I really have given this question a lot of thought, actually, not in that specific framing, perhaps, but like, how, how can a person go about lessening violence towards minority communities and all the rest? So the, and to be 100% honest with you, I am sort of shocked personally that I've come to this conclusion, but I don't think you can educate people out of that to be 100% honest with you. It's not like they're ignorant and oh, if they become educated about the issue, now the violence dissipates. That's usually not what's going on there. So I don't think you can educate people out of being violent. I think you can educate people who don't understand what things that don't look like direct violence are, you know, like microaggressions. You can educate people about like in, in, the, in terms of like racism, what systemic racism looks like. They very clearly recognize it when somebody individually is being that way, but they don't see the system. So you can educate that. But an individual person, like I don't think it's education. I think if you want to change that person's perspective and them not be committing acts of violence against minority people, it's a, it's a change of their heart, not a change of their education. And so how do you affect the change of somebody's heart? I think in most queer people's lives, we have the experience that until somebody in our family comes out as queer, our family can say all kinds of stuff like, oh, we support it and all the rest. But once someone comes out, then you see how it is. And many, many families I know, uh, they have talked about being inclusive, they've talked about being supportive. But then when their, you know, children come out, they aren't. They, they say things like, well, we support you in your lifestyle choice, as long as it's not here around us. And you're like, what? Like, it's just me. It's not a choice. I didn't, I'm not having, living the blue eyed lifestyle. It's just how I am. And the fact that we are this way, and it's not some like, like rebellious teenage phase we didn't grow out of is, is an important thing to understand because you can't educate us out of not being that way, which is why conversion therapy is simply torture. It's not a matter of educating us. So, you know, it's, you have to change these people's hearts. So like, can you change it through education? I mean, maybe, sure, perhaps some people, but in the gross sort of violence that we're talking about, the people who commit those acts? No, I don't think you can. I think you have to speak to their hearts in some way. So how do you speak to people's hearts? Well, I think you do it in a couple of ways. I think you demonstrate to people that you're like them, not terribly different. Sure, you know, maybe left-handed or right-handed, you know, you wear Adidas versus Pumas, whatever, but like essentially you're the same. And it's that sameness, it's that demonstration of sameness, that commonality of human humanness, right? The 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 humaneness of being human, which gets separated from people. We're my community isn't people. We are our labels, we're our gender, we're our sexuality. I'm not me. I'm I'm all these things instead of being me. But when people interact with me, they're like, wow, you're 
such a regular person. I thought you would be so different. I can't tell you how many times I've had that experience. You mean something they're like, oh, I thought you would like sound different. I thought you would look different or talk to them like, well, I don't know what you were thinking, but like, we're just like people like everyone else. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. You see it when, when new cultures start to immigrate into other places, right? There's a lot of xenophobia until people start to meet them and you start to wear, understand their culture and they're yours. And, and thus it goes. So it's, there's a process there, but this is a deliberate thing. And so, you know, I appreciate groups who like put on uh, like Trevor Project who, of course, like provide tons of aid for young people who are going through really hard times and provide a bunch of uh, resources for people who are feeling, you know, challenged with suicidal ideation. And I appreciate, you know, groups like PFLAG who educate uh, parents and, and education centers and companies and all sorts of stuff about how to be inclusive and how to be purposefully that way. It's one thing for a company to say, we want to be inclusive and make sure we hire, you know, queer people and minority people. But that doesn't just happen. You have to specifically do it. You have to let those people know they can feel safe working there, participating there, which is one of the things I want to do in the Green Party. Like, you know, like, look, there's not a lot of us. So I, how do I show other trans folks and gender nonconforming people that the Green Party is not just a viable place to politically organize because we do support us, but an actually good place to do it where people will help you and your causes are part of the general causes of the group. I and mean, I think the only way I do that is by showing them, by doing the things with us, by y'all doing them with me, and then being able to demonstrate that it's not just lip service. It's not just a bunch of people saying, oh yeah, we, we, we love you queers. You're the best. It's so awesome. You know, we either, I think you either walk the walk and talk the talk or people see through it and you lose all integrity that you might have in the eyes of the public we're a leftist party we don't have big money <laughs> we can't afford to have the people like not like us we really need to have the goodwill of the people and we're only going to get that when we have good policies that we articulate well to them the other guys i mean like it's hard some people clearly love oil and they clearly love war but if you don't love those two things your choices are really limited i got to be honest with you but many people would rather sit out you know it and i know it right half of the voting electorate in the united states chooses not to vote because they don't feel anyone represents them mostly they've never heard of us if they have they have weird ideas about it. it's like oh are you all the the free marijuana party i mean yes of course but that's not even really the thing right like it's so far down the thing but we have a valid a real anti-war platform and we're the only electoral party in the united states that does it we have a real honest to goodness gender rights and transgender platform and we're the only party in the country that has it these things are meaningful tangible Pro progress for my community. So it's important for me to show it. And you may have seen a, an email that we sent out earlier today talking about TDOR in general and the Green Party and its support of queer rights. But back in 2004, when by and large, the entire Democratic establishment was anti-gay marriage, they were really against it. Jason Platts, mayor of, in, of in New York State, performed four gay weddings and got arrested and put in jail for it. Greens lead the way on these issues and we will risk being arrested the same thing like it at, at the line three pipelines and all the rest all those people who went to jail for saying those pipelines are going to leak and they're going to destroy that water well guess what happened the pipelines leak and they destroyed all the water that's exactly what occurred they were all right and they were all willing to go to jail for it and greens always will stand up like that and it's one of the reasons you know, that is frustrating as it can be to organize politically with anyone, really. But like, we're so passionate. We believe in these causes so deeply that I actually have a lot of hope that if we can harness our energy and put it together correctly, we're going to make a big change and we're going to make it in the right kind of way. And overall, I'm just, it's a hard time to be, you know, like dealing with these issues because they're really challenging and they come on top of all the other challenges that we face. So it can seem kind of insurmountable in a way. I think education there definitely helps, right? Being able to break down the situations into smaller chunks, address them individually and keep them separate. But you know, to address your primary question, Damari, yeah, I think it's not education. I think it's a speaking to the heart deal. I think it's a demonstration of, you know, sameness and like, you know, we can strive together for a common goal. And I'm not your enemy. You know, I'm 
I might disagree with you, but we're not enemies. And so. Thank yeah. you. We have uh, hands up with Anne, Michael Pan, and Gloria. I'm asking that people put their questions in the chat. Um, Could I so, say something on the education question? Yes, that's why I haven't unmuted anyone else. Cynthia? All right, yes. Yeah. I think education is vital because this is the thing. There are, a lot, uh, there are a lot of people who are coming out younger and younger and younger. I was at a TDOR ceremony at a church on Long Island about maybe four years ago where I met the mother of a trans three-year-old and the trans three-year-old who was, if anything, more articulate than some of the politicians I've tried speaking to. And they were wonderful. They were wonderful. And they were very glad to have someone like me around that each of them could talk to. That's what I do. I will go to any place that won't kick my butt out of the door. And I'll say, you want somebody to actually talk to y'all who is trans, who is intersex, who is a chimera, who is on the asexual spectrum. I will talk about this. I'll offer my stories. Those that are from people who've told me to tell something of theirs, uh, things in the media, instances that have happened to people, so that people can say, I've met at least one person. And I always give the caveat, I am not the end-all, be-all. I, I do not represent every single person on this. Y'all will still need to actually meet other people and know more about this. But I will tell this, my story and talk about my experience. And I've done that for over a thousand places, including colleges, including GSAs for 12-year-olds, including high schools. Oddly enough, at the GSA for some 12-year-olds, they seemed more up on the current terminology and gender labels than I was, which was actually kind of fun in its way. This is the point. People, the, the average people are actually getting better on this in a lot of ways. Now, I'm not saying that the world's a cuddly place and I can go home and work on my nails. I'm saying that more people are aware of this. More people are coming out. I, uh, last night, I just got to watch a Jeopardy episode with a transgender uh, legendary champion. I'm not saying that one example of what's in the media, truth that everything is awesome. But the point is, people are talking about this. The problem is that many of our politicians lag light years behind the people and are trying to frog march us back to some hideous swamp of ignorance and misery and uh, people not being able to talk about themselves. I've been out don't of the train. I don't mean to interrupt you, Cynthia, but uh, yeah. what can we do to positively change that? I was about to say that. I've been out as a trans woman for 26 years. I've seen things get better. And this is the thing. The people are getting better. A lot of the uh, resources are out there now. We didn't have the Trans Lifeline when I first came out. We have all the resources. We have all the people. What we need is for those resources to be given more time, more funding, more energy, more people volunteering, more people who are as open as I am, if you're up for it, should be talking at city councils, at libraries, at colleges, at high schools. The best thing to combat the bad guys who don't want us out is for those of us who are out and do feel safe or at least safe-ish talking about our truth of our lives to go and talk about this. A friend's kid actually was in, a, a friend of mine's kid was in an elementary school class where somebody just started telling the whole class, some young person said, oh, there's this guys, there's this girls, you are whatever you were born as and no one's ever anything else. And my friend's kid, I won't give any identifiers, but my friend's kid said, I met Miss Cynthia and she's both, so you're wrong. The fact is people are being more open about this. And what we need to do as educators, activists, and political, uh, you know, people who work on, on political change is to give as much of our energy, time, and willingness to speak as we feel safe doing to those people. I hope that gave some good kind of answer. Yes, thank you. The next question. I will say if I, I if yes, I could Laban, like thank you. brief, I'll, I'll try and keep it brief because we've been on this question a bit. But education isn't. I'd say education is a bit, a bit much more as Cynthia was touching on with normalization. If we look at gay marriage, for example, and we look at where it was 
even in 2008, the approval ratings that we see of people supporting legalized gay marriage, it's, it's at an all time high now and nearly double of what it was even 12, 14 years ago. Why is this? Because it's been normalized. It's, it's not so scary when you have a coworker who's, who's gay. Like you don't have to make a big deal of it, but just being able to understand fear mongering works best when you don't understand. That's why it's so easy yeah. to make immigrants, for example, the big, big scary group, because if you don't meet immigrants, then how would you know anything about that? When it comes to the trans community, how can you address that? You know, how can you address the fear mongering being, being put forward? You don't know anyone who's trans. This is the same thing that was back when I was five with the gay community, with the queer community, as it was with the trans community. You don't have to make it a big point of who you are. But by being open, by being out and proud, you normalize it. You make people understand that it's that we're not this big scary community trying to trans the kids or whatever they're saying on Fox News. We're just people just like them, no different, trying to live our lives just like they are. And at the end of the day, education includes just being yourself. You don't need to go out of your way to educate. Just existing and being yourself and being proud to be yourself can be enough for some people. Thank you. Um, I see a question about how can we find information on trans legislation that's showing up in states? Um, in particular, uh, Michigan, I know I'm from Michigan. We're having a lot of stuff going on right now. Um, does anyone else have a, a really good site that we can add that gives information about where you can find information on the different trans, transgender positive and negative um, legislation that's in uh, showing up right now? Question. Then there is, I know the lavender caucus. There's also the question directly for Blazon um, from Anne. Um, I saw your ad for the school board. What response did you get to the campaign? Do you feel that people's attitudes have changed towards you or transgender people in general as if they heard more about your campaign issues? That's for Blazon. Yeah, so the, the problem we run in with, with my campaign is something as similar as Danica Rome did when she ran to become the first openly trans person like the state legislator. She ran on strong policy, not on being trans, but she was open, she was out, she was proud, and she didn't hide it, but she didn't make it a big focal point. And so even more conservative people weren't so scared of her. That was a big thing for this campaign. Obviously, I faced a lot of harassment online because people were offended that there were they then pronouns being used in reference to me and they suddenly got doctorates in English overnight to correct me on why that was incorrect but generally speaking I met with people going door to door canvassing meeting with candidates who were scared of the trans model policy for example I met with them and they supported me they liked what I had to say why? Because I had real meaningful issues because I was a young person who cared. I don't think they never realized or they never processed. I mean, I had my pin on that said they, them, but I can't think but knocking one of the more red leaning parts of the city. And this guy, clearly a Trump supporter, was like, well, you know, I like what you have to say. You know, I I'll give you a vote. I uh, can't wait to see you on Fox News in a few years, though. And it's like those things of I don't need to be out and like, oh, I'm, I'm trans. But just that subtle implication of looking on and seeing, you know, there's the, there's the they them pronoun pins on my on my little um, satchel I'm wearing. But I would say there was certainly an aspect to normalizing it. Danica Rom won because she she didn't make a big point of it, but she definitely normalized being trans. She was human and she cared about a variety of issues, not just transness. My support is well documented from this past year, from last year, fighting for strong trans policy, but at the same time. I didn't make it a big issue because it's well documented. I am who I am. And at the end of the day, people's minds are going to be made up by the actions I take. Being out in a city where trans people, where queer people haven't historically had power is impactful to, again, moving the needle forward in normalizing and making even the most conservative people understand that we're people too. Thank you for that. 
Um, I had one question for Margaret, because uh, I've seen amazing stuff go out through the Lavender LGBTQIA plus caucus that I'm proud to be in. I know that you've put out some things basically letting people know about the legislation that's being attempted in places. Uh, can I put you please on the spot and just ask where people can find that? Because I admit I go to places like the Lavender Caucus and other sites like that to get my info. The other uh, yeah. question, go ahead, Margaret. Yeah, no worries. Uh, Cynthia, yeah, that's a great question. There's tons of places to find like piecemeal bits, but a good place is ACLU, who have a, a pretty decent and up to date listing of all the pending and proposed laws that are, are being, you know, targeting our community and the uh, results of ones that they've already been tracking. So, you know, if it failed or if it's dead or if it got just kicked out of committee, that kind of junk like that. So that's where I go like to see the actual like legal texts. And then you can usually go to the state themselves and there you can see their legislative session. So I just go there and look at the actual proposals uh, depending on the depending on the state. So not so ACLU is a good clearinghouse for all of it and then go to an individual state if you want to see more detail. I'm gonna to go to uh, Gloria's question. Gloria's um, question is you mentioned the sex work becoming legal in all states. What else in the Green Party's platform needs shoring up and changed to make sure that we as a party internally and public facing are seen as firmly behind acceptance and equality of everyone? What can be done if, for the platform? I'll take a I'll take a stab at that or pass at that I suppose <laughs> for you. a high level pass. So in the platform, I actually you know it, we mentioned it early at the start. We did just have a platform amendment which specifically states that turf ideology is not green and they don't belong in our party at all. Which is not just a good step because you know it's like definitely making a declarative statement that certain positions are not green but it it's a great step because it specifically talks about you know the the um so-called feminists who are anti-trans which is a very very specific kind of subset of thing which is going on in our broader culture so nailing it specifically and speaking directly about it was great I thought it was a, a fantastic move, and I really appreciate uh, Nevada yeah. Green Party for bringing it forward. And to be honest with you, I I wasn't sure that would ever happen. <laughs> Progressive as we are, it's still sometimes difficult to get things like that directly. So, you know, there's obviously more stuff, as Cynthia was mentioning. Uh, sex workers' rights are really important for a lot of reasons. But one of the reasons, obviously, that it's important for our community is many of us find ourselves in financially challenged positions just to kind of put this in perspective but right, we all kind of know that like you know and i know this is going to sound weird but like you know a man makes a dollar for their work per hour whatever it is right and and a woman will make like 70 cents to that dollar um a trans woman makes 30 cents to that dollar so we're way way down and so when you when you add all that in and all the kind of discriminations that we face it's very difficult to find gainful employment that pays anything close to a living wage mostly we can't unless you're one of the few who are really you know a tech person outside of that you know we're really kind of put into more marginalized positions in society and what do you do you know, you're going to try and feed yourself, you're going to pay your bills and all the rest. And so having it, you know, sex work um, amendment in our platform would be great. We tried back in 2017. So came around in 2018, and we almost got it. We failed by I think what nine votes. So it was almost the 75%. And I'm very much eager to try again, because it's very, very important in our platform. And it would be a really, a really solid conclusion to are very, very progressive ideas towards gender, towards um, agency for people and for workers' rights, which are all really important to us as individual Greens. Thank you. We do have a lot that's in there that's very good. We do have affirmation of people's gender identity and expression as what the Green Party supports. We do have that the Green Party supports the bodily autonomy of intersex people and that informed consent must be given in all medical decisions affecting intersex people and their families. All that stuff is good. I'm glad that we 
I, I'm not glad that we needed it. I am glad that we got that thing that Margaret talked about to say that you don't get to throw some very bigoted interpretations of feminism at trans or gender diverse people. I mentioned that things that we should be working to fix in platform and other places in the party. Yes, this, we need the sex worker, uh, the sex work positive, you know, Basically, we need that amendment that says we decriminalize and destigmatize sex work, that we support the decriminalization and destigmatization for all the th reasons I said before and what Margaret just said now. I also feel that we should make sure that all the stuff on intersex makes it clear that we want to make – that we are urging any hospital – or medical center or medical professional who is still trying to do unnecessary and non-consensual procedures of any kind on intersex people of any age, particularly children and babies, that we say, stop that. I was proud to be on a panel with you, Margaret, and with A.J. Reed in 2020 and 2021 and in 20, yeah, this year too, talking about all this. I'm glad that we got to support the a successful push to get Lori Children's Hospital of Chicago to stop doing such horrible things. I think that our platform should, if, if it does already say that we urge medical people to, to not do bad stuff on intersex people, particularly kids, then we need to make sure it says it even more explicitly. And the other thing is, since so many of these hideous, hideous bills are targeting uh, basically two things, our right as gender diverse people to use a public bathroom or our right as trans or gender diverse kids and youth to even be ourselves. I think those, that we should have a pl platform and other documents in our party more put that forward. Particularly, I know we have a youth rights section. I need to look at that again. I think we should have something both in the youth and uh, gender identity, sexual orientation, like wherever people think it belongs that says, that under the rights of young people who are in any way different from standard cishet expectations, be they LGBTQIA or, all, or many of those at once, that they have the right to not be detransitioned by politicians making their medical decisions or by school boards making their educational decisions, that youth rights are for youth. So that like Whitney's saying, the children are our future. I think our party needs to have the most explicit and straight up language saying we're making sure that's the case, especially for trans and gender diverse youth. Thank you so much. We're at the four o'clock mark, one hour. Is there any uh, closing remarks of Blazon, Blazon, Margaret? Um, is there anything else that you'd like to add? This is a memorial service that is trying to help us find a way to reduce the number of people that die every year. Um, we are trying our best in so many ways to make it so that we don't lose our loved ones in such horrible ways. I've got a question that Michael Pan just sent into the chat. Let me go ahead and read that. Um, skipped it, I'm, I'm going back to try to find it. Michael, if you can send it again, that would be excellent. I'm not finding your question. Right there it is. Wait, wait do, you is. Support, <laughs> do you support by boycotting institutions where they don't respect African-Americans, trans, et cetera? How about creating separate institutions for African-Americans, trans, et cetera? Um, segregation is not the answer. That's my um, response. Let's have the other three people uh, give their answers. Who wants to take this one on? I'll give a I pass. actually think that, oops, you go. Uh, yeah, no, so I, 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 so yeah, there's there's valid reasons for every group to have institutions for certain, which are specific to them, which advocate for their causes and their issues. So I absolutely support that. I think it should be fine. I think every group should be able to have an advocacy group that represents them com like completely. That's the group's focus. So that doesn't bother me at all. My issue comes in general when like 
we're not able to cooperate because those institutions can take different perspectives on how to achieve the same objectives. That That's a political thing which can be worked through if people want, right? It, it takes effort. But I think, yeah, so I, I definitely believe that each group should be able to have a, an organization or advocacy group that is specific to their rights and needs. And I think trans people should have one. We basically don't um, because there's so few of us, right? I, I would say to you that the closest that we might have would be the Human Rights Commission, but based on what they did to trans people during the Obama administration, I would venture to say that most trans people who worked during the Human Rights uh, Commission era to get Edna passed completely feel betrayed by the HRC. And so we feel like we have no political representation as a as an organization or activist group. So that's my answer to that. Yeah, this is the thing. I feel that, yes, it's one thing to have stuff that's trans-specific or other identity-specific for people who feel they uh, are not represented elsewhere. I also, though, feel that everybody who should who claims to represent everybody's diversity and everybody's civil rights, civil liberties, whatever the heck it's called these days, need to represent everybody. Uh, and when it comes to separate stuff, my problem is simply that there have been some legislators in some states who are trying to do an equivalent of segregation on trans people. Uh, at least one state down south, I don't know if it went through or if it failed or if it's still uh, up for debate, was going to have the idea that if I, I as a trans woman would go there and I'd have to look for bathrooms that said pretty much trans accepting, trans affirming rather than just I'm in a public place, I got to pee, let's just find the place. And in terms of some groups and services, there have been things that have left people feeling betrayed, including past administrations. Uh, I, I know that one issue I didn't raise during the other stuff I was talking about is that the TSA has been pretty uh, not great on intersex. If you look up Hida Valoria's essay, Fear of Flying, in parentheses, under the TSA, while everybody seemed to think that uh, things would get better once uh, Obama got in, unfortunately, they didn't for intersex people. The body scanners in airports that kick many intersex people off of flying if we go through them were done under that. So I feel that every group, every agency, every everything that says we're working for all people's civil rights, then they need to be working for all the people. So I do feel that if that, for example, like trans people who feel betrayed by some of the larger, uh, more mainstream, what some people have called the gay establishment, feel we need a trans specific thing. I'm fine with that. I'm just not fine with people being dropped out the bottom and, oh, well, this thing that may not cover all your stuff, but, it, you know, like LGBT, when I'm looking for a trans specific thing, then it there darn better be a something that makes it clear which is which. So yeah, if if we're in it for all people's rights, they can nobody gets left behind. Yeah, if I could address the question as well. The first part about boycotting institutions, obviously yes, but you have to acknowledge that when it comes to boycotts, they're only effective if you can organize. Take, for example, unions going on strike, which is one worker, nobody's going to care. In fact, it could weaken the cause. So when you have a union organized, ready to go on strike, to demand that business change its practices in a way that benefits the workers, then that's when change can happen. I mean, we've seen effective boycotts long before my time, where effective change was made to support communities of color. But what you see in this in today is that, that doesn't happen. We see companies do bad things, but there's no collectivized effort to, to boycott. And while this is a very powerful tool, I haven't really seen in my lifetime it being quite so effective as a means to of affecting real meaningful change. Not that we shouldn't try to, again, utilize this as one of the many avenues for creating effective change in our country and our society. But until we can organize, it's in effect just to be as an individual like, well, I'm not going to Chick-fil-A. I don't, but again, I'm not hurting the, the company's bottom lines as my individual self. Going into creating new institutions, speaking to my own experience here within Chesapeake, when our city was formed, 
60, 80 years ago, an organization called the Chesapeake New Men for Progress came about. And that was meant to, with this new city, to ensure that African Americans had agency, had power. And that organization was essential in getting our first elected Black leaders in our city, many of the many of whom have gone on to do go into state government to do bigger and better things. And this is an organization that continues to exist in this day because they need an institution to support them. I am all in support of our community having those same institutions of being able to come together and to, to support ourselves to get people, of course, into elected offices, but also that could act as a way to actually create effective boycotts against institutions that seek to suppress us, to demean us. But until we have that again, it, it's tough, but it is it, it can be an important tool if we can come together and create it. And at a national level, it's much harder because it requires much more people, much more labor as opposed to a local level where you only need a few hundred people. At a national level, a few thousand of us sadly cannot create as an effective and a change without having many, many people behind us. But to, to leave on a more more positive note, because you know, there's no point in being down. The, the world sucks. Everything around us sucks right now. You know, we still have power. We still see society moving forward. There certainly is an ability for us to create change, especially looking at historical trends in the United States about how historically suppressed communities have been able to, to leverage change in a way that has pushed society forward decades. I think it's very well possible within our means to accomplish that within our community, as well as the vast majority of people who do support us and who are loud about supporting us and approving of our rights. Thank you so much for that. I want to reiterate what I meant by um, segregation is not the answer, is isolation and refusing entry to people, not segregating and allowing um, individuals to have private organizations for people of their um, affiliation. I mean, that's what we have all of our um, personal safe spaces at. Um, let's uh, go ahead and close this up. Does anybody have any last closing remarks? Uh, I'll simply say that this was a very intense and I feel powerful event. I'm glad that people are willing to come out on this. I'm not happy that we have to keep having Transgender Day of Remembrance as a current event. I don't like thinking about well, next year we're going to have to do this again. I offer all my work, all my activism, all my hopes, and all my prayers that I want us. I want to see old people who want this better to be able to do the equivalent. I'm daughter of a construction worker to take one of those big ass wrenches that I'm sure my dad used at some point in his career. Take whatever horrible pipeline has been flooding us with violence and death knock that thing down to a trickle and then just uh, jam the darn lug nut or whatever. I want to see this become more of a historical day, but for now, we still have to fight, and that includes being ourselves. That includes, uh, whether as trans, gender diverse, in, in other ways, as allies, anybody who wants things better, well, we're, I feel we're in the best political party to work on this. We're not beholden to the corporate people. We're not beholden to bigotry. We are a gender affirming people positive party. And I want us to work on everything we can in whatever ways we can to make the situation better. I think that's a great way to end this. Um, I'm gonna pass to uh, Dee, are you standing by? Dee and Starlene are the co-chairs for the National Women's Caucus. Um, Dee, Starlene, does yes. either one of you? I'm here. There, here is Dee. Okay, are, so are you finished with your, with, is, is this the end of this then? Yes, We're done for now. Okay, okay. so, um, well, we want, just want to thank everyone for coming and um, appreciate the questions and the comments. And uh, we hope that you will, continue to learn more about this very important topic and um, so that you can equip yourself with the um, knowledge to support and learn more about what is needed to be done in the Green Party. Um, I'm putting the 
uh, website to the Women's Caucus in the chat. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone wants to put the website for the uh, Lavender Caucus in there. I don't have that memorized. <laughs> um, that would be great. Um, but if you have any questions or um, need to contact us, you can go to the website for that. And please also visit gp.org if you haven't been on that website already to learn more about the Green Party if you are new to the Green Party. So thank you again, every everybody, and uh, have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Dee. Thank you, everyone, for Thanks showing for up today. Us. Thanks for hosting it. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Good night.